Hello, and welcome to this bonus edition of the In The Tank podcast. I'm Jim Lakeley, the Vice President of the Heartland Institute, and my co-host today is Chris Talgo. He is a senior editor here at the Heartland Institute. And our guest today, uh, for the fourth time on our podcast, is Brian Kilmeade. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's the host, the co-host of Fox and Friends on the Fox News Channel, also the host of the One Nation program on Saturdays on the Fox News Channel. He also hosts a show on the Fox Nation app called What Made America Great. He's the author of several history books on, for instance, George Washington, Andrew Jackson, Sam Houston, Thomas Jefferson. And he, he is here today to talk about his latest New York Times bestseller, The President and the Freedom Fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and their battle to save America's soul, now out in paperback. When we last talked to you about a year ago, we started off talking about uh, a speech President Biden gave about the soul of America. Well, since then, he's really focused on this topic even more. I'm talking, of course, about the red speech that Biden gave in Philadelphia this summer. Uh, I wonder what you made of that speech. You know, in the history of, of presidents, you've written several books on, on the founders and great presidents of the United States. I wonder what you, what you kind of make of that speech and how you think history will judge it decades from now. I mean, compared to the two people that I have featured in this book, Lincoln and Douglas, uh, doesn't add up. In fact, compared to any president, it's just terrible. I don't know who wrote it, who designed it, who did the lighting, but it was just awful. And what it was, it was designed to do is to make everyone say, I know I haven't done well as president. I know my policies haven't worked out, but I'm so much better than Trump. And that whole messaging started about two months prior. The MAGA, those MAGA extremists, the ultra MAGA. Who are they? They're going to destroy the country. It's all about January 6th. Excuse me. 74 million people voted for them. They weren't all there on January 6th. None of them. Uh, most, uh, almost all of them were not even involved in any type of violence. In fact, they were usually beat up. Uh, they're usually victims on all this stuff uh, with Antifa and what have you. But no one's defending January 6th. But he wants to make this election all about that. Because if you talk about the infrastructure package, of in your, the rescue package, um, nothing's been done. And then he passes the other new Green Deal package, which is masquerading as an inflation reduction bill. And nothing's really affecting the economy or people's lives positively. So he's kind of doing what President Obama did with Mitt Romney. Let's make Mitt Romney unelectable so you don't focus on my first four years. Hmm. I could not agree more. Now, Brian, uh, in his speech, uh, President Biden said that we are at an inflection point in America now, of course, we were during the uh, days of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass at an inflection point. But do you think we are now? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't, you know, people are all caught up in now. This is the worst time ever. This is the most divided we've ever been. We, I can't believe how America is ready to blow. I don't know. Um, I think we got some real issues. I think the issues uh, that are front and center with uh, the binary same-sex uh, uh, transitioning, um, use of pronouns. It's just idiocy. It's just a total sideshow. So if you think half our country is for that sideshow, then you could say it's an inflection point. But I think Democrats are more like the Van Jones statement over the weekend when he said that all those things are throwing married people off, make them think Democrats are un, un, lost their minds. If you watch Bill Maher, same thing. You know, he's like, well, when you vilify all Trump supporters and you spend all your time talking about Donald Trump, period, and you wonder why America is divided, there really is no mystery there. And what Donald Trump did do this well and this do that well, at the same time, they're a Democrat who would never in a million years vote for him. I think that's where most of America is. So if you're caught up in thinking that America is these extremes that the president's playing to, then I think you can think we're divided inflection point. I know one thing, you know, you're looking at a one term president who said he was a transitionary figure. Maybe that's what he was talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, I mean, Abraham Lincoln was a uh, technically a one term president. I mean, <laughs> because of elected was, twice, was, right? Elected twice. But yeah, didn't really serve out his second term, obviously. Uh, so so the book is uh, Abraham Lincoln or the president and the freedom fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass and their battle to save America's soul. Uh, you know, it got me thinking, Brian, from the last time we talked about your book and, and now, you know, why isn't Frederick Douglass more celebrated in this country? I mean, how many people that have Black Lives Matter signs in their yard even know who he is and why he's an important historical figure? 
I mean, it, it wasn't always this way. I mean, uh, I'm of a certain age. I was a kid of the 80s. I, I learned about Frederick Douglass even in college and W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. You know, are they even featured much much these days during Black History Month? I mean, why are no, they allowed think, to fade? I don't think so. It'd be interesting to bring them up constantly like we do the Founding Fathers because they deserve all the credit. Frederick yeah. Douglass and, and most people give Lincoln that credit too, but Douglass absolutely... A uh, guy born a slave ends up being a best-selling author, leading speaker, globally known, and then a newspaper editor, writer, um, and he seems like half Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, and, and half Norman Vincent Peale. So I think that Frederick Douglass is a great figure, but I, this is one thing I won't be critical of textbooks about, and that is that evidently when he lived and died, he his zenith was right after the Revolutionary, excuse me, the Civil War. And even knew it. He's like, you know, whatever I do is going to be second best toward pushing America towards freedom, pushing the president of the United States towards integrating to hire, having black people fight for their freedom, letting them wear a uniform, carry a gun, uh, being invited and attending the you know, second inaugural, sitting on the uh, on the platform with the president, being invited to the White House, having a one on one, even though everybody in the world was at the inaugural. But I found out that Frederick Douglass, after he died in this turn of the 20th century, kind of disappeared. This guy, Phil Foner, F-O-N-E-R, was the one who brought him back in the 50s. And then he brought him back into the forefront right after. And then people tell me who've been doing this for generations say, listen, don't get caught up in that. There are different people at different times who emerged from history. And one was now Grant. Grant, hmm. they say, if you're going to put money on any historical figure to get more and more, move more and more up the rankings, it's Ulysses S. Grant. A lot has to do with Ron Chernow's book. But also the facts of his life. He got, you know, they told us, well, Grant was a great general, overcame a lot of odds to do it. No one would have projected him there. But as president, it was ripe with corruption. And you think, well, he was corrupt. No, he wasn't corrupt. He trusted a lot of people around him and it kind of screwed up his second term. Uh, but he was honest as the day is long. His, his memoirs of the standard, which everyone tries to live up to. So to me, Grant is the guy to bet on. But people go up and down. I mean, they just took Alexander Hamilton out of the Capitol. How do you do that? So they took Lincoln off a of grammar school. How do you do that? It's not cool to like Columbus, but what he did is it was more risky than going to the moon in the late 60s. And what he was doing is uh, changing the world. And if you like Christianity, he probably did more to forward Christianity to another hemisphere than anybody else. So people were celebrating him for a while. Now that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, so Brian, you brought up the fact that you know some of the uh, heroes in your books, uh, such as Abraham Lincoln, you know, are now uh, seen as you know oppressors. You also wrote about uh, Andrew Jackson. You wrote about uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. So why do you think that uh, in this day and age we're tearing down their statues and we're you know tearing up you know what they did and and how can we how can we besides you know reading your books. Uh, help make sure that you know the next generation understands what these people did, good and bad. I'm a former history teacher, and I think it's very important to teach what these people did. You know, and and I think that our our uh, future generation is losing that. Yeah, I mean, we're very arrogant. This is a very arrogant generation. They feel like they know more, and they're and they're embarrassed by our history, as if everyone in our history can benefit from knowing. Oh, let me look into the future and decide how to do this. You know, uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, George Washington, they were born into a slave culture. When you look on every hemisphere on the planet, slaves everywhere. In Africa, there were slaves. The American Indians had slaves. We were high profile. We should have got rid of it earlier. Absolutely. Wish we never brought it here. Uh, absolutely. But they tried to get rid of it in their lifetime, but they didn't do it. In the North, there was no need. And there was a sense that we have to move past it. And then the fight ends up being when the country gets divided. So I think that you could go through our past and stop judging and start learning. So you got to change your mindset. Hey, I got to learn about this. So this, yeah, Jefferson had slaves and you know what? He was a bit of a womanizer downside. Now the upside, incredible ambassador, great, uh, a great uh, leadership through the whole uh, Barbary Wars. Uh, he was somebody that uh, was able to double the size of our country with the Louisiana purchase. Uh, he was able to write the Declaration of Independence. He was able to be vice president for a secretary of state and a two-term president. I believe there's a lot of upside in that. It doesn't mean, I just like to meet these people that live the perfect life. <laughs> Who lives the perfect life? You are subjected to the times in which you're born. I'm sure people are going to look back 50 years from now, maybe 20, 
and say, what were they thinking in 2022? I mean, why, why were they doing what they were doing? Like, why? And, and, and we'll be looking back, maybe at that time, if we're still alive, we'll be saying, yeah, what were we thinking back then? But we're not going to judge it. We'll study it. Yeah, I, I, you mentioned Hamilton, Brian. Uh, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, I remember seeing a glowing profile in sixty Minutes of uh, Lin Manuel Miranda about his popular, you know, the popularity of his musical Hamilton and a diverse cast. The only white man in the cast actually was King George III, famously. And now we've come 10, 15 years later, and now Lin Manuel Miranda is apologizing for his own play, which was considered revolutionary at the time. This has all happened so fast in our culture that even a, you know, a woke, diverse Hamilton musical that is the biggest hit in, in Broadway in, in decades is now considered problematic. And if that's the case, how the heck is somebody like Thomas Jefferson or Sam Houston or even Abraham Lincoln not problematic? And Frederick Douglass, for that matter. Yeah, a lot of people don't like that self uh, that, uh, you know, take take charge, self-made man. Uh, Frederick Douglass, they want to blame society for whatever situation they're in, whether Asian, black, white, male or female. Uh, you look at Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington, born a slave too. said, OK, I'm going to change things around. I'm going to get an education. Frederick Douglass, same thing. I'm going to change things around. I'm going to make an education. I'm going to take things upon myself. Uh, society is not fair. Life isn't fair. I didn't know who my parents were. I end up going to school by myself. I'm going to prove myself. Next thing you know, I'm a schoolmaster at my own university, Tuskegee. Uh, I overcame things. People don't like that message because it makes it seem if you don't overcome, you're a loser. Mm. Or if I, I'll teach the lesson that society's not fair, we got to fight to change society, which is socialism. It's not things going to work. And I think Booker T. Washington used to paraphrase, said, no doubt about it, things are harder for blacks in America. Um, and they used the term of that day. But when we do achieve, the, the strength and fortitude we have to show to get there is going to make us stronger in the end. Man, people don't want that. They don't want to hear that self-reliance message that America still provides opportunity, uh, that if your generation struggles, the next one won't or struggle less, that the Italians, the Irish, they were Germans. When they break in, they have a hard time, but when they eventually they get accepted. No doubt about it. Blacks had the hardest, came here against their will. In many cases, slaves, I understand, but that was generations ago. Now it's your country. Make it better. But don't uh, don't you don't make it better by tearing it down. Yeah. And Brian, you know, in, in, in today's day and age, it seems like the victimhood narrative is, you know, the coup de grace. And, 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 and the, the more victim you are, the more that society owes you. What I love most about all of your books, especially uh, your latest book about uh, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, is that they were both victims in some ways and they both overcame them to to become, you know, uh, archetypes of, uh, you know, th their era. Oh, yeah. You have a hard time making uh, telling Frederick Douglass or uh, Booker T. Washington that life's too tough if they lived in your day, if you you were able to eyeball them. They're all about overcoming. It's a great message. It's the message we all should be using. I don't yeah. care what your background is. Overcome it. Well, you know, my mom abused me. My dad was an alcoholic. I only had a single parent. We never had any money. I couldn't go to college. Whatever it is. OK, what'd you do about it? What'd you do about it? And if you're given a lot, then it's up to your up to you to. Uh, maximize your potential and then help other people along the way, most likely you will. I think that's what we got to get back to. I wonder if any politician could get elected by saying, regardless of your circumstances, overcome it. You got to grind it out. Uh, America is known for their toughness. Be a great American success story or do everything you can to become one. And the respect you get in your community and around your country will allow you to be an example to help the next generation along the way. And the self esteem you get by taking things upon yourself, even if it doesn't come out great is something that you're never going to get marching or holding a street sign or protesting or putting on a Facebook page how upset you are. Yeah. Uh, we only have you for another minute or two here, Brian, but uh, I just want to get back to the book a little bit and the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. I mean, they didn't always see eye to eye, uh, <laughs> but they learned to uh, they, learned, they learned more about each other and they became, they became friends of a sort. And uh, they certainly learned to respect each other. Uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that relationship yeah. and, and what we may be able to learn from that actually in today's uh, pretty s strife ridden in, times. Uh, in the paperback, we, uh, I added uh, what happened after the assassination of Lincoln and the fact that they brought his uh, casket around the world, around the country. And that Frederick Doug was able to see it when it came through Rochester. And then uh, Mrs. Lincoln knew how special uh, these two had the quick bond together. Uh, they had respect for each other's career from afar and he got a walking stick 
um, an ivory walking stick from uh, the president. He thought that she would de- he would definitely like that. And then 10 years later, the famous freedom statue that caused so much controversy when Black Lives Matter was taking over the country and everyone thought it would be a good idea to burn down cities. Uh, Frederick Douglass dedicated that statue. Never loved it. He's like, oh, okay, what are they thinking here? Even though it was designed, it was financed by freed slaves and uh, the design was uh, something fully approved by the people of that time. It wasn't the sitting president that was asked to dedicate that statue. It was Frederick Douglass who talked about, hey, listen, he was your president, not necessarily mine. Uh, you know, he was a white man's president at the time, but he ended up being everyone's president and then pointed out too that, you know, if I wanted him to move quickly, free all the slaves and let everybody fight for their freedom. But if he listened to me, he would have had no country to lead. And that's why I was so frustrated. But I don't see, he didn't see until 10 years later that Lincoln, doesn't matter what Lincoln thought, he had a country that would fall apart if he pushed him too far, too fast. There would be no Northern fighting force. And then eventually uh, they would take over in terms of uh, who they are. This guy, uh, Frederick Douglass, born a slave, the most adverse conditions you could imagine. Uh, his mom, he said, visited him twice in the middle of the night. That was it. Uh, he was sold off, sold off, sold off. But the one thing that he knew is that he had to learn to read and write and that he would be free one day. And he would. And with uh, Abraham Lincoln, he had the advantage of being white, but almost no other advantage. Uh, mom died young. Uh, dad abusive. Or just a person of his day, abusive, we would call him today. Didn't want him reading, that it was a waste of time. He taught himself to read, and his dad would see what a great worker he was, would actually license him out to other farms. So as bad as you can get, it's always better than being a slave, but Lincoln didn't have it much better. He walked miles just to get a book and just to be able to read that book and, and to become a lawyer and just help people out and uh, losing, uh, losing a bunch of elections including the Senate seat that he wanted so bad from Illinois, but he impressed so many people along the way. It set him up perfectly for this new party called the Republican Party, where he would become the nominee. And with the Democratic Party, what we now know is the Democratic Party so divided, he would become the president of the United States. Hmm. Yes. Well, Brian, you, you had mentioned uh, Ulysses S. Grant is a, is a historical figure that's been getting a bit of a rehab uh, job from historians these days. Uh, you, you've written several books on history. What's what's next on the docket for Brian Kilmeade? I think I'm going to talk about the relationship between Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington and how they just accelerated race relations in America in a way nobody even knew. Uh, mm-hmm. And the way they worked together for the, the, fre- the president and this activist, um, uh, president of Tuskegee University, Old Black University, was able to do and teach, and the methods that he relayed, it's just phenomenal. And when they combined forces, they were unstoppable. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks, Brian, for being on the show today. He's the author of The President and the Freedom Fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and Their Battle to Save America's Soul. It's now out in paperback, so go get several copies for you and your friends. Thanks, Brian. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, uh, Jimmy, Chris, thanks so much, man. Appreciate it.